Hi, thanks for joining us today. Um, my name is Lee Scrivener, and I will be giving you a lecture on American Romanticism and Transcendentalism called Where There Is No Path. Uh, thanks for joining us at the American Center. Since I'm new here, uh, and this is my first lecture, uh, I'm going to say a few things about me, myself. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, then I will uh, discuss uh, a few cultural things that kind of led up to American Romanticism and Transcendentalism from uh, the past, sometimes the far distant past. And then after that, I will uh, discuss the Transcendentalist writers in the United States um, and what they ended up kind of doing with some of those issues that were that they were the inheritors of. Um, so this is my lecture, Where There is No Path, American Romanticism and Transcendentalism. So my name is Dr. Lee Scrivener. I'm a former lecturer in English at the American University. Um, I have a PhD from the University of London uh, from 2011. And I, uh, I have a master's degree in English from the University of Utah. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I've taught at uh, UNLV, uh, Boazici University in Istanbul, um, and the University of London itself, and most recently I've taught English at the American University in, uh, American University in Washington, D.C., uh, usually teaching English, humanities, things of that nature. Okay, so um, I also have a, a book published in 2014 called Becoming Insomniac, about the 19th century. Um, so some of the stuff we'll be dealing with today, most of it will be taking place in the 19th century between 1830 and 1860. My book is a little bit, uh, period-wise, is a little bit later than that, uh, but it covers some of these issues that we will be discussing today. Okay, so um, Where There Is No Path, I entitled this essay, or this lecture, Where There Is No Path, um, it has several meanings. Um, it's uh, this can be considered largely a lecture on um, on liter on the literature of Romanticism and Transcendentalism. But uh, in order to kind of have an entree into some of the issues, I want to look at just a few images from American Romanticism from American Romantic painters from the same time period, maybe a little before, a little after, um, because a picture is worth a thousand words. Here we have, uh, oh, next slide, please. I'm sorry. Uh, so, next slide. Uh, we have Thomas Cole's Lake with Dead Trees from 1825. Uh, as you can see from this image, the United States at this period is still in large part a trackless wilderness. Um, there is this experience, if you can imagine, uh, settlers coming to the New World um, were confronted by this wilderness leading off into the West uh, as far as the eye can see. And they still actually didn't know to some extent when that or where that uh, when the settlers, pioneers, first started entering that wilderness um, as they headed west. Uh, I think the, the west in the United States maybe connotes a little bit, I can't be the first person to say this, but uh, kind of connotes something a little bit, has the same kind of significance as the east does for uh, Russians, uh, the east of Russia being less settled. Uh, for Certainly it was the case, I'm actually getting kind of a lot of sun in here, let me just... <laughs> The sun just kind of poured through the window. Sorry about that. Um, anyway, the the east for Russia is, uh, probably has some of the same resonances as the west, kind of the western United States does for uh, Americans. So uh, certainly, when <clears throat> Americans first stumbled upon this new land, it was very evocative for them, and uh, it almost brought. Uh, it brought out of them uh, very ancient sentiments that equated um, there being no path with a 
Okay, sorry about the uh, dropping the uh, feed there for a second. Um, so, as I was saying, in our, uh, so when the settlers first came and confronted this new land, they saw, they saw or they felt that uh, it, it evoked in them a, a, an old uh, connotation between spiritual discovery and seeking uh, new lands in uncharted territories. And this goes back to the Arthurian myths where they, uh, the, if those who sought the Holy Grail wouldn't be able to find it unless they went into a land that had been, uh, that had not been traveled before. So if you were a, uh, if you were following someone else's path, you would not be on your path. So it really speaks to American individualism that, um, that everyone needs to kind of find spirituality by seeking their own path. So when Americans first came and saw this pathless wilderness to a large extent, they felt like um, this, this really kind of resonates with me and my sense of spiritual discovery, and it just reinforced some of those priors. Um, <clears throat> okay, next slide. Um, from the intellectual history, uh, European intellectual history, uh, some of this appreciation for nature is uh, is very Rousseauian. Um, Rousseau uh, was a French philosopher who uh, thought that that civilization itself is not a not a a refining uh, tendency or a refining attribute but it is a corrupting influence. And so for Rousseau, those who lived closest, closest to nature uh, would be closer to purity, um, um, that the state of nature was innocent, and that people were at their best when they were uncorrupted <clears throat> by <clears throat> the unnaturalness of civilization. Okay, next slide. Now, this can be uh, contrasted with a thinker like the English philosopher Thomas Hobbes, who conversely thought that nature, man in his natural state was, um, was having a tough go of it, and only through nature, or only through civilization uh, and uh, a political state, and uh, the political state that a, a civilization would lend itself to create uh, that uh, humans could kind of rise above uh, what he called uh, the war of all against all or bellum omnia contra omnis. Uh, so, so Hobbes and Rousseau are kind of in contrast in that sense where Hobbes believed that uh, nature was brutish and only through civilization could you be refined into something a little bit more stable and workable. Uh, and Rousseau believed that um, nature was something to cherish and that the corruptions that he saw around him in urban uh, Paris or whatever were, uh, were the result of humans getting away from nature. Um, next slide. So here's another picture. Uh, painting from Asher Durand, Kindred Spirits from 1849. Um, this shows the artist with William Cullen Bryant, who is a, uh, a American uh, uh, literary figure from this time period and a uh, major uh, romantic poet. Next, next slide. One last uh, kind of North American artist. Uh, here we have Frederick Edwin Church, Niagara. Uh, and as you can see, the uh, image here is one in which uh, nature is, is shown in, in this kind of overpowering glory. Uh, and one can only be kind of caught up in the majesty of it, uh, far greater maybe than, uh, than one would find in uh, like a church pew in New England or something. So they were speaking to the, the kind of spiritual enlightenment that one finds out in this kind of wild, trackless, trackless nature. Um, 
one of the attributes of romanticism, American romanticism, next slide, uh, is the sublime. And the slides I just showed you were examples of the sublime. Uh, and we get the sublime from uh, a classical work called On the Sublime. We don't really know what the author's name was, although some people call him Pseudo Longinus. And uh, the sublime, you the effects of the sublime are an over an overpowering sense of emotion and a loss of rationality. The sublime leads listeners not to persuasion, but to ecstasy. For what is wonderful always goes together with a sense of dismay and prevails over what is only convincing or delightful. Since persuasion as a rule is within everyone's grasp, whereas the sublime given to speech an invincible power and invincible strength rises above every listener. So the sublime, in other words, gives people something that is beyond our kin, is beyond our kind of rational conception. Um, so, you know, you can think of it as those things that you actually know are familiar to you, therefore somewhat tame to your mind. And, um, and so they could never give you this feeling of awe or, uh, or danger or fright. Uh, they become so familiar so the sublime is that unknown thing beyond uh, beyond that gives you that feeling. And these are the kinds of things that American Romanticism uh, embraced and the Transcendentalists. Okay, so Romanticism can be juxtaposed with the Enlightenment um, as a, an answer to uh, empiricism and rationality reason of the Enlightenment. So we juxtapose these two. Enlightenment uh, is based on reason, uh, I'm sorry, uh, next slide. Reason, empiricism, what our five senses tell us, that's how we get truth. Um, enlightenment promotes skepticism about, about things metaphysical, promotes science. So things that are beyond our rational ken, uh, we, um, we, uh, the, the, these are things that Enlightenment uh, thinkers kind of prize. Uh, thinkers in this uh, milieu are Locke and Newton. Uh, contrast that with romantics, romanticism, where truth is more subjective, based on emotion or in instinct. They embrace the metaphysical, the unexplained, the unknown, as I was just saying, and Goethe, Shelley, Keats are some of the European models that preceded our kind of main transcendentalist writers by about a generation. Okay, next slide. Now, uh, Romanticism in North America was also a response to English Puritanism. Um, you know, obviously, it's kind of interesting that those things that, that I was just describing about how uh, the American uh, thinkers wanted to go beyond, um, you know, the, the normally or the well-trodden path into the wilderness. Uh, they, they actually came from a tradition of Puritanism, where the Puritans, uh, the English dissenter movement, uh, for the previous, the hundred or two hundred years previous to this period that we're talking about, the 1830s, uh, the English dissenter movement, the Puritan movement, the Protestant Reformation in England, um, they were a rejection of the well-trodden path trod by the previous generations of uh, religious people, and mainly against Rome and Catholicism. So it, they came from a tradition uh, in England where um, the Lollards and the Diggers and the you know, many, many groups uh, did things that were considered heretical by the dominant or the mainstream Christian or Catholic church at the time. They uh, did the unthinkable by translating the, Eng the Bible into English and, um, and, and therefore kind of sidestepping the priestly intermediaries. So they got in a lot of trouble. Um, and uh, so they kind of went their own path and rejected the tradition of Catholicism. 
A few generations later, uh, our, romantis, our romantics and transcendentalists uh, in North America uh, in turn rejected what they now saw as the dogmatism of the Puritans. So this is a constant one-upmanship or a, you know, a, every, every new generation rejects the previous generation to a certain extent and tries to find their own path. Uh, so they are both an example of and a rejection of the things that came before them uh, in their tendency to reject the things that came before them. So it's kind of interesting in that, in that way. Um, so in other words, you know, to put it more succinctly, uh, the romantic, the romantic movement and later transcendentalism, uh, well, the transcendentalists wanted to, uh, get beyond some of the more strict, uh, protocols of, uh, or dogmas of Puritanism and claim that, you know, we can find our God in nature. We can, we don't need to you know, listen to the, uh, strictures of Puritanism. Okay, uh, next slide. Um, this is just to say that most of the writers that we will be speaking about um, uh, hailed from Massachusetts, really in a very small location and kind of just outside of Boston, Concord, Massachusetts. They're New Englanders, and so therefore, kind of their own genealogies pit them in, you know, or put them in uh, this cultural milieu of. English Protestantism from which they came, uh, from which their ancestors came, and so their 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 being there uh, served them well to take on board some of this tradition and respond to it to a certain extent. Okay, uh, next slide. So transcendentalism. It started around the 1820s and 30s, mostly in the New England area, as I just described. Uh, people and nature are good and pure, but society, technology, and civilization corrupts them. Uh, people should be independent and self-reliant. Insight comes from subjective emotion and intuition instead of devotion to empiricism or scripture or the enlightened sages and philosophers of, of the past. Influenced by English and German romanticism, the biblical criticism of Johann Gottfried Herder, the philosophy of Immanuel Kant, and the German idealism and German idealism generally, as well as Hindu spiritual texts, especially the uh, the Upanishads. Okay, next slide. Now, the preeminent transcendentalists and the founder, really, of transcendentalism was Ralph Waldo Emerson, and he was born in 1803 in Boston. Next slide. His main, uh, some of his main writings uh, are, you know, par for the course things as you would expect based on the preview I just gave you of some of the, uh, the intellectual uh, foundations of transcendentalism. So quotes from self-reliance, nothing is at last sacred but the integrity of your own mind. Nothing can bring you peace but yourself. Now some of these might sound, I mean for one they sound um, not too different than you know, they're kind of talking about different things, but, you know, things you would find in Descartes, the cogito, I think, therefore I am, uh, a, a privileging of the self, uh, subjectivity, and that's your first entree into truth. So it's not too far from those kinds of, of things uh, in, the, in the grand scheme of things, but it's definitely in that, in that tradition or it takes it further. Um, next slide. In uh, his... Longer essay, uh, Nature, Emerson, uh, it's, it's long and it's, it's complex, uh, but it starts this way and it speaks again about how uh, we shouldn't look so much to the past and that we should recreate and have, and have an immediate sense of, uh, of spirituality, uh, culture, etc. So he's first condemning our age. It's, he says, our age is retrospective, which means backwards looking. It builds sepulchers of the fathers. It writes biographies, histories, and criticism. The foregoing generations beheld God and nature face to face. We, through their eyes, why should not we also enjoy an original relation to the universe? Why should not we have a poetry and philosophy of insight and not of tradition, and a religion by revelation to us, 
and not the history of theirs, embosomed for a season in nature whose floods of life stream around and through us and invite us by the powers they supply to action proportioned to nature, why should we group, grope among the dry bones of the past or put the living generation into masquerade out of its faded wardrobe? The sun shines today also. There is more wool and flax in the fields. There are new lands, new men, new thoughts. Let us demand our own works and laws and worship. Okay, so once again, this is just, uh, you know, writing the signature of the new world uh, by saying this is a new world. You know, we just got here, I guess you could say, and uh, this age of discovery, this sense of discovery that is before us. Uh, he's kind of writing that, and to a certain extent, rejecting uh, what came before. Uh, this is st stated even more explicitly in American Scholar. Next slide. In 1837. Now, this is an interesting quote because he's um, he's actually giving this as a an address to scholars, um, and uh, he's. It's a strange thing almost to be saying to scholars because in, in essence he's saying, uh, on the one hand, don't, don't put yourself in such worshipful awe of the people that you are studying as scholars. Uh, but on the other hand, it's, it's quite inspiring because he also says that you yourselves are their equals and uh, through your scholarship or through your writing or through your discovery as intellects, uh, you can be as great as they were. Uh, so he says, instantly the book becomes noxious. The guide is tyrant. So the, the book, the guide of, of past thinkers, uh, can be a tyrant to us if it doesn't let us grow and we just passively accept things that they say. The sluggish and perverted mind of the multitude, slow to open to the incursions of reason, have once so opened, having received this book, stands upon it and makes an outcry if it is disparaged. Colleges are built on it. Books are written on it by thinkers, not by man thinking, by men of talent, that is, who start wrong, who set out from accepted dogmas, not from their own sight of principle. And here's the kind of famous quote, meek young minds grow up in libraries, believing it their duty to accept views which Cicero, which Locke, which Bacon have given, forgetful that Cicero, Locke, and Bacon were only young men in libraries when they wrote these books. Okay, next slide. Henry David Thoreau, another uh, of the most famous transcendentalists, was a student of Emerson, and he was born in 1817 in Concord. And uh, I'm just gonna, next slide, I'm just gonna show you a, uh, a poem that he wrote called Rumors from an Aeolian Harp. Um, you know, and like I said, so the American Romanticists and Transcendentalists were drawing heavily from their uh, European and English uh, counterparts. Um, so Samuel Taylor Coleridge, a famous English Romantic poet, had a poem called The Aeolian Harp. This, uh, you know, obviously the same topic um, and similar sentiment. So let's see where this goes. There is a vale, which is a valley, which none hath seen, where foot of man has never been, such as here lives with toil and strife, an anxious and a sinful life. There every virtue has its birth, ere it descends upon the earth, and thither every deed returns, which, it, which in the generous, generous bosom burns. Next slide, please. There love is warm and youth is young, and poetry is yet unsung, for virtue still adventures there and freely breathes her native air. If ever, if you hearken well, you may still hear its vesper bell and tread of highly sold and I'm sorry, and tread of high souled men go by, their thoughts conversing with the sky. Okay, well, um, to really understand where this poem's going or what it's doing, uh, obviously you need to know what an Aeolian harp is, and I assume many do, but for those of you who do not, an Aeolian harp is a harp, much like you see the one in the picture, um, 
and it is uh, not really to be touched or played by the human hand. It's to be um, it's to be played by the wind. So the wind blows against the strings, um, kind of like a wind chime, resonates the strings, and the you can hear the strings vibrate and resonate. And this is the music of the wind, literally. Uh, now, interestingly, I guess for one who thinks that you know we should give ourselves up to nature, this is like, hey, don't. The sense of this is, you know, don't even play music. Just sit there and listen to Mother Nature herself play this music. Um, it is kind of interesting, though. I thought um, how it's almost antithetical, though, to this idea that humans, that you know, some transcendentalists like Emerson. Uh, you know, believe, maintained that humans are naturally good or nature, or humans are by nature good. However, uh, most things that humans do end up being corruption. So civilization itself is a human achievement, but it, is, it can also corrupt or it can lead to corruption. And this Aeolian harp, I mean, as beautiful as it is and as beautiful as the idea is, it seems like almost there's a sense in which, uh, you know, Humans, do not touch the harp. You're tainted. You are evil. That's where the the problem lies. You know, let the na let nature play the harp. Uh, don't get involved because you're just going to mess it up. Uh, you know, that might be taking it too far. But uh, so, while transcendentalism often puts man as a, a pure, uh, well-intended, uh, you know, actor in the world. Some of these, some of this poetry is so pro-nature that man ends up being kind of almost an antagonist to that. Um, so anyway, uh, I guess next slide. Most famously, Thoreau is uh, the author of *Life in the Woods* or *Walden*, and uh, he lived in. Okay, so he was a resident of Concord, and he decided, well, I really. You know, I, my appreciation is na of, for nature is so great that I'm going to put my, uh, you know, live up to my what I claim, uh, and and actually live in the forest for two and a, two years and two months. So he went to the forest and built a cabin, uh, kind of far away from his fellows, and uh, in that time wrote uh, what became his book Walden: Life in the Woods. And it's full of these kinds of uh, sentiments. We need the tonic of wildness. At the same time that we are earnest to explore and learn all things, we require that all things be mysterious and unexplorable. That land and sea be in indefinitely wild, unsurveyed and unfathomed by us because unfathom uh, unfathomable. Sorry, <laughs> English. We can never have enough of nature. Uh, Margaret Fuller was another major transcendentalist, born in 1810, a uh, colleague and a friend of uh, Thoreau and Emerson. Um, she is she died tragically before her time in uh, a shipwreck, just 50 miles from shore off the coast of uh, New York. Uh, next slide. One of her major works is called Summer on the Lakes, and this is a uh, an account of her journey to the Great Lakes region, which at the time was very unsettled, so it was very wild. Uh, the Great Lakes region, Lake Superior, uh, what is now you know Chicago, just north of that area, uh, Michigan. And uh, the, the book presented a sympathetic portrayal of nature and Native Americans, including members of the Ottawa and Chippewa tribes. So she actually, you know, she spent time among these tribes, and it was a sympathetic portrayal of, of them. Uh, and uh, next slide. Uh, to a certain extent, this may have uh, influenced uh, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's decision to visit some of that same area. So he visited uh, Lake Superior and wrote Song of Hiawatha, which is, uh, again, has a similar, similarly positive or sympathetic portrayal of the Native American tribes in that region. Um, some people, first of all, uh, Fuller and Longfellow were um, 
actually Fuller was also a literary critic and reviewed Longfellow, some of Longfellow's work. And uh, she did not really like Longfellow too much. Um, but needless to say, Longfellow followed her in some of her interests. And uh, so this was published 1855 after Fuller had already died. Um, some people say that uh, that it's a little bit uh, sentimental and um, maybe depicts Native Americans in a in a light that had already passed, um, an anachronistic light, uh, because they, by that time, were not, you know, purely antithetical to kind of Western civilization as they may have been when first meeting the new settlers. Uh, so they, you know, many Native Americans lived in towns and, and things like that. So this was maybe an anachronistic or sentimental portrayal of Native Americans. So he received some criticism for those kinds of things. Uh, nonetheless, it could have been seen as a, uh, a tribute to Native Americans and the, the waste in that part of the country. Okay, next slide. Okay, Herman Melville. Uh, another romantic, not necessarily a transcendentalist writer, but uh, born in 1819, or not a member necessarily of the uh, transcendentalist community. Um, but he's most famous for Moby Dick. Next slide. So romanticism. Um, he dedicated Moby Dick to Hawthorne, who we'll talk about in a few minutes. Uh, Moby Dick, it's an, an immense book, considered an American classic, uh, you know, one of the mainstay novels in American literature, uh, and it's extremely hard to kind of put in, in a nutshell, but I will just read that uh, biographer Laurie Robertson Laurent uh, sees epistemology as the book's theme. Ishmael, who's the main character, uh, his taxonomy of whales demonstrates the limitations of scientific knowledge and the impossibility of achieving certainty. Uh, she also contrasts Ishmael and Ahab's attitudes towards life with Ishmael's open-minded and meditative uh, polypositional stance as antithetical to Ahab's monomania, adhering to dogmatic rigidity. To, so to a certain extent, Ishmael might represent something like the Romantic or the Transcendentalist Whereas Ahab, Captain Ahab, who happens to be on this quest to find this and kill this whale, uh, is the the more rigid and do dogmatic individual that uh, Romanticism contrasts with. Okay, next slide. Uh, finally, we have Nathaniel Hawthorne. Um, just some editorializing. He happens to be my favorite of the writers from this period. Um, he was born, next slide, he was born in, this slide, he was born in uh, 1804 in Salem, Massachusetts. And some of his, most of his writing is, uh, it's romantic. Uh, it belongs in that same genre uh, of romanticism, uh, but he does have some interesting critiques of romanticism and transcendentalism itself. Uh, he's a very subtle and nuanced writer. Again, it's never extremely like it, it's n he's never hitting you over the head with like didacticism or this is, you know, the message. Um, it's very nuanced, and he he basically has nuanced nuanced criticism for all comers um, if you read his his stuff. So um, we're going to move on. Uh, next slide. I'm going to talk just a little bit about it, uh, maybe a lesser known um, story, a uh, short story that he wrote called The Celestial Railroad. And it is a, it is a parody of John Bunyan's Pilgrim, Pilgrim's Progress, which again is an answer to Pilgrim's Progress being a, uh, a work of Puritanism. So he's answering Puritan, Puritanism. Um, or responding to English Puritanism in the form of uh, parody. Uh, so, in John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, um, we have a pro pilgrimage that's described, and uh, the parody is that Hawthorne's Pilgrim's uh, 
are uh, going by train. And uh, so it's, it's kind of you know, meant to be funny, but along their journey, um, next slide, they, uh, they, they come across um, some problems, just like John Bunyan's Pilgrim. Um, but listen to how this encounter is described, and I'll kind of tr say why it's relevant to both in answer to Pilgrim's Progress and also in answer to uh, or a critique of uh, uh, transcendentalism itself. So bear with me for the, the longer text here. Our coach, so if they're on a train coach on, on this uh, kind of ridiculous uh, pilgrimage, our coach rattled out of the city and at a short distance from its outskirts passed over a bridge of elegant construction, but somewhat too slight. I imagined to sustain my any considerable weight, as I imagined, to, oh, sorry, uh, that's kind of small text for me. Uh, it's somewhat too slight, as I imagine, to sustain any considerable weight. Both sides, on both sides lay an extensive quagmire, which could not have been more disagreeable either to sight or smell, and had all the kennels of earth emptied their pollution there. Um, This, remarked uh, Mr. Smooth it away, who was his guide, is the famous Slough of Despond, a disgrace to all the neighborhood and the greater that it might be, that it might so easily be converted into firm ground. So he's saying uh, this is an insult to the neighborhood, this swamp, basically a slough is a swamp. Uh, it's, it's a disgusting place and all the worse because it could easily be made firm ground. Uh, I have understood, said I, that efforts have been made for that purpose from time immemorial. Bunyan, John Bunyan, uh, writer of Pilgrim's Progress, mentions that above 20,000 cartloads of wholesome instructions have been thrown in there without effect. Very probably. And what effect, uh, next slide, and what effect could be anticipated from such unsubstantial stuff, cried Mr. Smooth it away. You observe this convenient bridge. We obtained a sufficient foundation for it by throwing into the slough some editions of books of morality, volumes of French philosophy and German rationalism, tracts, sermons, and essays of modern clergymen, extracts from Plato, Confucius, and various Hindu sages, together with a few ingenious commentaries upon texts of scripture, all of which by some scientific process have been converted into a mass like granite. The whole bog might be filled up with similar matter. It really seemed to me that the bridge vibrated. It really seemed to me, however, that the bridge vibrated and heaved up and down in a very formidable manner. And in spite of Mr. Smooth it away's testimony to the solidity of its foundation, I should be loath to cross it in a crowded omnibus, especially if each passion passenger were encumbered with his heavy luggage as that gentleman and myself. So this, uh, what's highlighted in yellow here is uh, our works of literature prized by the transcendentalists. So in fact, I, I just checked. So if you actually go to the Wikipedia entry for transcendentalism, most of these things that Hawthorne mentions are, are mentioned as the kind of foundational texts of transcendentalism, uh, Hindu, and as I described earlier, they were interested in Hindu writings in the Upanishads, um, German rationalism, ger I'm sorry, German uh, Enlightenment thinkers, um, and, uh, and idealism, and uh, Goethe, etc. So he's, he's basically saying that, I think, he's saying that uh, the, the, the train that's making this journey is maybe transcendentalists themselves, and they are assuming they can make as much or more progress uh, towards enlightenment as their predecessors did by these new texts. And he's saying, well, you know, if you're if you're as beholden to these new texts, 
it can be they can be just as useless as as the older text that you used to rely on. Um, okay, next slide. So the the train goes a little bit further, and the passengers being all comfortably seated. Now we rattled away merrily, accomplishing a greater distance in 10 minutes than Christian, the main character in Pilgrim's Progress, probably trudged over in a day. It was laughable while we glanced along, as it were, at the tail of a thunderbolt to observe two dusty foot travelers, the old pil in old pilgrim guys with cockle shell and staff, their mystic rolls of parchment in their hands and their intolerable burdens on their backs. The preposterous ob obstinacy of these honest people in persisting to groan and stumble along the difficult pathway rather than take advantage of modern improvements excited great mirth among our wiser brotherhood. So at first it seems like he's mocking these are the characters from Pilgrim's Progress because they're still they're not on the train they're still kind of walking along the side of the road in the old way of taking a pilgrimage and they're saying ah what's wrong with these people they're not up to you know they're not up to 19th century uh, technological standards, and um, so they're kind of mocking them for maintaining these old ways, uh, but then it kind of gets interesting. Next slide. We greeted the two programs with many pleasant jibes and a roar of laughter. They're mocking them. The engine manager also entered heartily into the fun and contrived to flirt the smoke and flame of the engine or of his own breath onto their faces and envelop them in an atmosphere of scalding steam. These little practical jokes amused us mightily and doubtless afforded the pilgrims the gratification of considering themselves martyrs. Um, so we think that the, uh, the people on the train are kind of mocking these travelers, but at the end of the journey, uh, it's discovered that the uh, the, the travelers, uh, Christian, gets to the city, and yet uh, the people on the train actually don't. Uh, well, actually, they, they make it to the city, but the, their guide is revealed to be the devil, and then the narrator wakes up. So it just puts in an interesting... Um, it, it kind of summarizes everything in an interesting way where, you know, no one is... No one has all the answers. Those who think, who pride themselves in like being conveyed easily towards uh, the celestial city, um, are actually not really going to get there. Even though they think, oh, we're going to get there so so easily. And here's these other people who who are uh, kind of misguided uh, and doing things the old way, and they end up getting there first. Uh, so anyway, he, he just has as much scorn and critique for his transcendental. Uh, brothers and sisters as he would for traditional Puritanism or something. Anyway, so um, with that, next slide, um, I think I will take questions. It's just an entree into Transcendentalism and Romanticism. Thank you very much. Um, let's see. I, I don't know if If I'm supposed to take some questions here. Hmm. Okay, so I'm getting a few questions in the chat, so I guess I'm just going to read those. Um, someone says, I'm not very well versed in American literature and would like to know which American poet you consider to be the most famous romantic. Um, well, um, Pretty much the ones I just mentioned, uh, Edgar Allan Poe is also considered probably the one of the most romantic, uh, the poets of the romantic movement, uh, one that I did not mention, um, mainly because he is, uh, he's not kind of geographically centered so much uh, in Concord, Massachusetts, as these other transcendentalists are. So Poe actually considered himself more of a Southern writer. Uh, I, you know, I'm a great admirer of Poe, but um, uh, he was kind of based in Baltimore, so uh, I just put him, I, I probably shouldn't have ignored him, but he's uh, one that I'm definitely 
overlooked as far as this discussion went in terms of romantic uh, poets, uh, American romantic poets. Okay. Um, oh, so the next question is actually a reference to Poe. Are you familiar with Poe's work and his famous poem, The Crow? Yes. So, like I just said, I'm, uh, I, I did... Uh, I, I, uh, I do like it's the Raven in, in American anth anthologies. It's, it's it's called the Raven. I don't know if it's translated to the Crow in Russian editions, uh, but the Raven is his most famous work. It's uh, quote the Raven nevermore, uh, and again, uh, someone I would love to discuss, uh, but didn't because he wasn't kind of geographically uh, in the range of what I was discussing for this lecture. Maybe I'll do another one. Okay, um, let's see, and what can you say, uh, and how can you relate to the memoirs of Griswold? Is a man tarnished the reputations of Edgar Allan Poe? Yeah, um, I actually don't know Rufus Wilmot Griswold or his relationship with Edgar Allan Poe. I'm not a Poe scholar, I do, I do like Poe, but I can't speak to um, his relationship with Poe. Um, where we can find traces of transcendentalism today, uh, I assume that's what that meant, uh, if we look for traces of transcendentalism. Um, oh, it survives everywhere, this idea that you, you can get back to nature. Certainly in the 1960s, uh, there was this rebirth of kind of romanticism, transcendentalism. They probably didn't call it that, but uh, people would go out in nature. Uh, B.F. Skinner wrote a book called Walden Two. Um, I've never actually read it, so I don't know if it's if it's exactly what I think it's about. But uh, it's people it, it, during that period. Um, the idea of uh, leaving behind society and discovering a new world for yourself out in nature. It's always been very attractive to a lot of people. Uh, building utopian communities in the wilderness and things like this. Um, some of them. Uh, survive better than others, but uh, so yeah, it's, I think it's an ongoing. Um, you know, I I put it, I put it, placed it in this time and place geographically and uh, temporally, but it's a universal human desire and something I think we all understand. This feeling of, you know, there, over the next rise, life might be better, and I can find uh, something new. Um, so. Can you advise further reading on Herman Melville uh, and his work Moby Dick? Uh, yeah, I've only briefly touched on Moby Dick for time uh, constraints, but uh, there's actually a, um, a short story by Melville that I really like called uh, Bartleby the Scrivener. Uh, no relation to me. The, Scri the Scrivener is his uh, his occupational uh, name, or his it's his occupation. He is a Scrivener, uh, which is like a, a copyist or a clerk. Um, so it's an it's an interesting book, and again, it kind of talks about um, the <clears throat> the problems of industrialization, perhaps, or of mass produ mass production. Uh, Bartleby the Scrivener ends up. Uh, coming to a, a bad end and kind of going crazy because he worked in a, well, I shouldn't spoil it. <laughs> Spoiler alert. No. Uh, anyway, check out Bartleby the Scrivener. It's a short story. Uh, it's an interesting one and one of his classics, I think. So that's uh, Melville's Bartleby the Scrivener. Um, and that's the only, I might not be getting an update on the questions as they come through, but that's the only other question I saw. So if there are no other questions, maybe someone might interrupt me or um, but otherwise, uh, we're almost to the top of the hour, so um, sorry about the technical difficulties at the beginning. As I got up to quash the sun, uh, the, the feed didn't like that, I guess. I don't know why it, it dropped out. But Okay, Dasha, thank you, Professor Scribner, for your lecture. Can we find the influence of transcendentalism in Russian literature? Uh, you know, that's a good question. I sadly am not as familiar with Russian literature as I would like to be. So, um, but I am sure someone can probably 
uh, shed their expertise either in the chat or for some other means on some of these issues as they arise in Russian literature. Um, I'm, I'm kind of coming to a brain freeze right now, so, uh, um, so I'm sure you could find some, but I don't, none are coming to mind at the moment. So thank you very much. I should have probably uh, figured that out before coming on today. Uh, maybe next time. So thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you very much for having me at the American Center. Um, I enjoyed myself immensely today, and uh, uh, thank you for all your questions. And um, uh, thank you. I'll talk to you next time.